is it just read the counter narratives, know there's another side, know it's not that simple, and it's much, much messier and painful and complex. Welcome to episode five of Truth for America. I'm Julian Vasquez Hiley, co host of the podcast. I'm a professor of educational leadership and policy studies at California State, the Sacramento campus. I'm also currently the education chair for the California Hawaii NAACP. Today, we're going to have a conversation about two recent books about Teach for America that were authored by alumni of the program. And I'm really excited to have the authors of two of those books and one of the contributing authors. So let's go ahead and um, have them introduce themselves. Hi, this is Kara Matsui, Teach for America Greater Philadelphia alum from 2011 to 2013. The author of Learning from Counter Narratives and Teach for America, Moving from Idealism Towards Hope. Hi, this is Jameson Brewer. I'm the O'Leary Fellow, Forum on the Future of Public Education at the University of Illinois. I was a 2010 Metro Atlanta Corps member. I'm the co-editor, along with Kathleen Demaray, of the book Teach for America Counter Narratives, Alumni Speak Up and Speak Out. Hi, this is Amber Kim. I am a professor at University of Colorado Boulder in Denver, um, lecturer at both of those campuses, and I was an Atlanta 2001 Corps member. I'm author of Chapter 9 in the book that Jameson edited. Um, um, it's called Perpetuating, Committing, and Cultivating Racism, The Real Movement Behind TFA. So the two books that we'll be talking about today both have a counter narrative in the title. And but what's really interesting is that these books took two different approaches. Uh, the book edited by Jameson Brewer really sought to bring in perspectives from core members from across the nation. Uh, you know, I just did a quick count and it looks like there's more than 15 different sites representing represented across the U.S. And then Sarah, who authored another, uh, you know, a comp- really a companion counter-narrative uh, book, took a different approach. In her book, she looked at specifically uh, a region, the Philadelphia more specifically, and she interviewed more than 30 core members in that region. So two really complementary approaches to understanding counter-narrative and these important stories about Teacher America. So if you could just talk about maybe the genesis of your book, Jameson and Sarah, where did it come from? Like, where did the idea come from? Yeah, for me, I shared a very small counter-narrative at Anthony Cody's blog at Education Week back in 2012, uh, where I really problematized Teach for America's academic impact model. I suggested that it likely accelerated burnout for Teach for America core members, right? This idea that they're they're told uh, that they are the foundation of student success or student failure. And so if a student fails, it's the core member's fault. And so I published that piece back in 2012. Throughout the years, I continue to get emails from core members and alums who reached out, uh, you know, thanking me for sort of sharing a perspective that, that they also shared, but stuff that they can never really express it to either Teach for America or to the larger public. And so after a few years of getting those emails, I, I finally thought, you know what, <clears throat> Teach for America's most successful component of their recruiting and their fundraising are positive core member stories. And for me, I felt that the public narrative surrounding Teach for America was whitewashed by the organization. And so I set out there, along with uh, Kathleen DeMurray at the University of Georgia, we set out to collect as many counter narratives as possible. We aim for geographic diversity, core member background diversity, to really provide a counter narrative to Teach for America's very whitewashed, corporate, polished narrative surrounding what Teach for America does as far as how they recruit, how they train, and how they approach pedagogy. And Sarah, so what what was the genesis of, of your book? I began this research when I was four member to, one, better understand some of the troubling complexities of what I was witnessing among my fellow core members. And two, I also began to explore this with the ultimate goal of helping to improve TFA and contributing to this broader movement for educational equity. To say more on what I was witnessing among my fellow core members, what helped shape some of my questions and survey and interviews with core members 
were these observations I had when I was in Teach for America. Right. For example, I would go from classes, Teach for America's mandatory all-course Saturday training, where there's a very particular rhetoric Teach for America has around work hard, get smart, no excuses, there's nothing elusive about successful teaching. Very much calling to the American meritocracy myth, very much emphasizing the power of individuals to overcome structural inequities. Of course, and that in contrast with what many core members seem to be experiencing, like core members would go from their mandatory training, for example, and many afterwards would go to nearby bars to drink to block out. Core members were describing, like, contrary to these different popular slogans, that in fact it was like, an incredibly challenging experience, and identifying what about it was challenging was very elusive as well. Like they didn't have, they did not have language or narrative to understand what they were struggling with. Even I think what was really interesting as I was reading through your book is there was a lot of slogans. Uh, Teach America has a lot of slogans. And of course, you know, as a researcher, you know, most of my engagement with Teach for America has been around data, uh, especially quantitative data and understanding, you know, the impact of Teach for America and various studies. And so getting this perspective from your book about all of these different slogans and then sort of the conversations that the core members uh, from Philadelphia use to sort of deconstruct those slogans. You talked about this sort of overlap with, with civil rights and how in Wendy Kopp's book, she really co-opted a lot of the language of the civil rights movement. Um, I, I thought that was just really, really fascinating. And so Amber, l- let me transition a little bit. So Amber, you know, y- you published a chapter in Jameson Brewer's book. So what did you think, uh, you know, how did you come to write that chapter? Did Jameson contact you? Did you contact him? Uh, and what did you think? What did you first think? Were you a little nervous about writing that chapter? chapter, what was in your mind? Well, when I first, a friend of mine who knew I was a very critical experience in Teach for America, she's the one that sent me the link. She got the link, the all call for, for these counter narratives, and she sent it to me. Hey, you know, what do you think about this? I never thought, I don't know, I can't, I can't write my counter narrative. It's true. I, I, what would I say? I have so much. I, I don't know what to say. Um, but then I took a stab at it, and when I started writing it, it flowed. Um, and I was able to talk about being a first gen student. I grew up in um, uh, the far south suburbs of Chicago. Um, first in my family to go to college and and I think I believed a lot of that rhetoric that was that you know if you just work hard enough you know the bootstrap mentality and, and I did it and I and now I'm living the life and you know I got myself out of poverty and so I wanted to spread that bill on in Teach America so it's a lot about in my chapter about recruiting recruiting my racism recruiting my classism my, my internalized classism my internalized my racism any of the isms that I had that, that was recruited and it was actually grown in the core, it was used and it was grown in the core. And I really believe that that was the movement. And it took me 10 years post-core to undo all that had happened. The trauma that was talked about in Sarah's book, like that, that primary trauma and that secondary trauma, and to undo all the things that were confirmed and validated and promoted um, about teaching in me. And, and if I hadn't gone on to do my PhD, I, don't, I'm, I hope that I would have unlearned all of this. But it took me a good... You know, eight to ten years to really come to understand, and that's when I found Jameson and Jameson's book and wrote my story. That really inspires a question. On Facebook today, you know, we're Amber and I are, are Facebook friends, and there was a conversation uh, on Facebook, and I suspect one of your Facebook friends made a comment. Um, about uh, basically what she was saying, if I can just summarize, is that your critiques don't resonate with her. And, uh, you know, I think one of the challenges of this is that you will meet Teacher America uh, alums who will tell you that they were excellent teachers on the first day and that Teacher America is about civil rights. And they'll say that these stories are inaccurate. Uh, that that's, that's a verbatim what this comment said. The other thing that they'll say is that, oh, well, Teach America in fill in the blank is different than everywhere else. So if they're from Baltimore, oh, Teach for America in Baltimore is different. Or if they're in San Antonio, they'll say, you know, Teach for America in San Antonio is is different from other sites. Uh, But as you look at these books, not only do you get sort of a 
a, a look at you know different sites across the nation and you see these sort of consistent themes, but you also get this deep dive in Sarah's book into Philadelphia. So why is it that, you know, and we were talking about some of the folks that are TFA proponents that contact us on Twitter. Why is it that you think that these critiques don't resonate with Teach for America? And why is it that they haven't really reformed their reform in response to these critiques? Last summer, Nonprofit Quarterly, they published a, a piece specifically about Teach for America, using them as an example of what not to do when facing critics and criticism. They mentioned the book and they said that Teach for America's response to this book, and, and generally speaking to any sort of critics, is to respond with arrogance and hubris, right? And I think that the, the culture of Teach for America, both at the national level, which of course is shrinking now, but even down to the regional levels, and it comes back to the point that you mentioned, Julian, is that, you know, if you pump up folks to, to think that, that they're engaged in civil rights, in, their, in the new civil rights movement, you know, any sort of questioning of, of the, the model or the approach, see it as a personal attack and, and how dare you tell me that I'm not the best and brightest or that I'm not doing, you know, the best thing possible for the country. And I think that the, when we see both Teach for America as an organization, but also its staunch supporters, they tend to always respond with this this air of arrogance that you know unless you're giving helping them become better with your critique it, it doesn't matter you, your critique is invalid but i think for me that's problematic in the sense that it automatically assumes that teach for america has a legitimate place at the table and that the folks who are working within the organization have a legitimate place and, and legitimate uh, work towards meeting these goals that they say they never step back to to really look at maybe the organization and maybe the approach is more problematic uh, than they've made it out to be. I don't know if you feel comfortable sharing this, Amber, but how did you respond to that person and how did you define what counter-narrative means? Okay, well, Sarah and I have had a lot of talks about this because I think we talk about experiencing this. Whenever we share our counter-narrative, whenever we share our story that runs counter to the dominant story, um, and, and our our narrative around TFA and our experience to Teach for America does not it, it runs counter to what they say they are doing and how people feel. We notice that when, and I'll speak for myself, when I'm sharing my counter narrative, I'm often silenced or shamed or invalidated by saying, well, I would have listened to you, but I'm not going to take you seriously because you weren't, what was the word they used? You didn't give me, you know, constructive criticism about how to solve the problem. So if you're going to come at me and tell me what's wrong, I'm not going to listen to you unless you're going to also tell me how I can fix the problem. That's um, what I've been told by high ups at, at Teach for America when I try to engage with them around the counter narratives. And that's what happened on, on Facebook today. Uh, someone read Terenda uh, White's um, piece, research piece, and, and she's in, in Jameson's book as well, and just was slamming it and invalidating it and saying, I'd have much more respect for this piece if it would have been um, constructive and told us what to do to fix the problem. And that's where I've had it. Because I, I feel like you can't, when people are trying to bear witness to oppression and pain, that, that's okay to do. And I'm tired, it's very dominant, white, privileged to tell someone that they cannot share their pain and their story unless they also couch it in constructive criticism. And I just, and I don't know if it's hyperbolic, I wasn't trying to be, but I talked about Frederick Douglass's narrative of the slaves and how crazy it would be to invalidate Frederick Douglass's work and say, well, I really, I would respect this narrative if you also told the South how to grow cotton. But since you didn't, I'm not going to listen to this. And, and that would be ridiculous. You wouldn't do that. So it's the same way for, for us. We have stories of pain. We're bearing witness to oppression in Teach for America, what the oppression of students, the oppression of teachers and of communities. And we're allowed to tell our stories without giving any hint of a solution because that's not always our place. And I think we have to reclaim that right to be valid just in telling our, our stories. And so I, even though I do have solutions and some ideas, I want to say them because I think it's okay to stay in the pain and talk about that and have it validated. I think that's, you know, I think that's uh, a, a very important perspective uh, that I don't think a lot of donors or policymakers, they, they don't have access to that. Because in places like Texas, for example, Teach for America has had several lobbyists in the Capitol talking uh, with legislators saying that we really need that $10 million again of state funding. And uh, executive directors of different cities, uh, and I've met many of them. They are really loquacious 
really interesting, really intelligent, and and inspiring. Many many of the people who who lead Teach for America's uh, you know different operations are are very inspirational people. But what would you say to a donor, or what would you say to a legislator, a policymaker? What would you even say to a college of education that's thinking about partnering with Teach for America based on you know these different experiences that core members have uh, expressed to you in these books. Well, what do you think needs to be said to them? What do they need to know? What What is that counter narrative that they need to be aware of that they're not often exposed to? I'm just like, I'm processing all the different things that are being spoken right now. Start, I think that there's a number of colleges of education that already have very strong opinions on Teach for America, as evidenced by some of them also supporting local movements that cut ties with TFA. I think there are also some policymakers that are also becoming increasingly skeptical of Teach for America's claims. Like, I think you see some backing away from no excuses narratives and the high stakes testing. What would we say to people who have power? What have we learned from the title? Because, I mean, that's what's in both of those books when I read Sarah's. It, it is. It's, it, I love the title, Learning from Paris. And what we learn by reading both all the 20 narratives in Jameson's book and uh, Sarah's counter narratives that she collected, that it's, there is pain. There's complex. There's nuance. It's not as simple as TFA or the neoliberal um, policies and the reformers make it sound. And I really do believe that when it's seen so simple and when you're listening to the rhetoric, the neoliberal rhetoric or the Teach for America rhetoric, it seems so simple and it makes so much sense on the surface. So if you immerse yourself in a few counter, in these two books and the counter narratives, it just, it, it makes it easy, it makes it dirty, it makes it complex and it makes it painful. And then you just make decisions in a fuller, in fuller knowledge, in, in a more complex truth that has, bear, you know, bears witness to, to some pain. No matter what decision those legislators make, no matter what decision those schools make, they'll be making it immersed in a fuller truth. And that's all we can really ask right now is that just read the counter narratives, know there's another side, know it's not that simple, and it's much, much messier and painful and complex. So who did you want your audience to be for the book? You wanted to be policymakers. Who did you have in mind? Other core members, uh, family members? I mean, who do you want to engage with this book? You know, when Kathleen and I first had uh, started this project, we had a conversation. I think for us, our approach in, in thinking about the, the types of chapters that we ultimately selected and included in the volume, the editing that we did, and, and really bringing everything together, we wanted our audience to be as broad as possible. We wanted to be able to give something to put a book in the hands of a principal, a school board leader, a policymaker, a current court member, an alumni, or somebody thinking about joining Teach for America, you know, because to a previous point, I really think that where the impact starts to happen is disrupting this idea that Teach for America is innately good. And I think that that is a, a myth that the organization has benefited from for the majority of its existence. And I think that, you know, having that wide audience for us and, and, and just thinking about policymakers, for example, you know, the goal of that is to hopefully uh, share with them that they ought to give some pause about approaching, you know, if, equity issues and inequity and fighting systemic poverty by fixing teachers or fixing education. I mean, it's, it's such a narrow and myopic sort of approach to fixing the systemic problem that allows policymakers to ignore the real issues that are underlying. And so for us, we, we wanted it to, to resonate across the board. And I'm really happy, and, and I speak for Kathleen here as well, with, with the end result. How about you, Sarah? What, who did you hope your audience and who do you hope your audience will be uh, for your book? question and I think it's one I'm still working through. It's shifted over time. When I first began this work, my target audience included primarily core members and also the Teach for America staff. So internal purposes. I I honestly I began much of this work with less of a political lens and more with the hopes of like and with the focus on immediate, actionable steps Teach for America could take to improve the program because I was witnessing all these core members around me really struggling and having struggles go unnamed by the organization and unaddressed. So I actually, when I first wrote and like conducted this study, I presented my findings to two TFA offices. I met with staff. I also provided a list of takeaways of like immediate actionable steps I thought they could take about also opening the conversation as Amber was saying to 
I think it has to do in part with a, with their epistemology, like how they know things, like who is invited to state their narratives, what happens when core members with experiences don't align with their popular narratives. So that was the initial the initial focus for me. That's also shifted over time as I've seen what happens when Teach for America doesn't have full control over the narrative. That's really interesting, Sarah, because I was wondering when I was looking at the sample in your book uh, where you had almost 30 different core members in the Philadelphia region, that it appears to me that Teach for America at its the initial stages seemed to be very supportive. But I guess it's not surprising that when you started to share the results with them that they were not as interested uh, in the counter-narratives that you were sharing. So I think with the the response that that we've had to our book, you know, starting with Teach for America's official response, you know, their response was that this is nothing to see here. You know, I've said before that Teach for America has a tendency to suggest that they listen to critique and criticism so well and they implement changes and solutions so well that if you critique them at 9 o'clock in the morning, the critique is totally invalid in a historical critique at 9.01 a.m. Obviously, that's not the case, right? And so Gary Rubenstein's chapter in the book, right, dating back to the early years of the organization, we see a consistent of a pattern of problems within the organization over the past 25 years, and so that is obviously not the case. The way that TFA really responded to our book was, these are just 20 disgruntled uh, core men- or alums, right? And so they're just 20 out of 50,000. I think Diane Ravitch in her post about it, she's sort of said tongue in cheek, yeah, I guess we should wait for a book you know, that's written by 30,000 people or whatever the number was. Most of the other feedback and, and impressions that I've gotten are, are people thanking me and, and really share and support the fact that, that we're able to bring these counter narratives together. And I think that for a long time, and, and Sarah said this and Amber said it too, these counter narratives have existed. Uh, but Teach for America as an organization has been successful at pushing them into the margins and silencing them and, and oppressing those types of voices. But just in the past few years, we're really seeing this counter narrative come out and come together. And I think that a lot of people, have, at least in, in my experience, have been really appreciative of that. I think there has been a range of responses from the different stakeholder groups, from core members, perspective, TFA recruits, TFA professors, and TFA staff. I think I would categorize those general groups differently. In terms of current core members, um, a number of core members, some who I haven't met, and also some who I interviewed, were really grateful to have a space to, to talk and tell their stories um, in a way that didn't have to be bound to the official dominant narrative of Teach for America. I think core members were able to talk about some of the complexities of what they were experiencing, to talk about the enormous amount of guilt and shame they had over feeling like and also being told explicitly by Teach for America that they were failing children and that it would be because they didn't care enough or because they had core members weren't working hard enough. I think they were able to talk about like the different things that they were struggling with, like like the different hidden costs to what was being required of them in order to quote unquote close the achievement gap that Teacher America says. And so different core members have reached out and expressed things and also asked what are ways that they can contribute to like, building a more honest narrative for the organization and pushing TSA to to be more critically reflective and to be accountable to some of the realities of its constituents and what impacts. Um, so that's one group. I think perspective members have also reached out with like similar questions or I think thanks for just providing another perspective on the program because like I don't claim that all core members' experiences match up to what I found in the 26 core members I interviewed, but it is a substantial substantial number of core members, and it is like a reality that's going for the most part unaddressed or it's being treated, as Jameson was describing, by TFA as an anomaly when it's not. There are a lot of people who are experiencing these very complicated and problematic realities. Responses from TFA professors, so professors who are looking at the university Teach for America partners with, the responses from them have been really fascinating. Different professors have reached out to me, including professors from the University of Pennsylvania, which is partnered with Teach for America Philadelphia. Professors have reached out to me and said that what I write about in my book is what they are still seeing right now among their classes of Teach for America core members. And what's really frustrating and saddening also is that they do not feel they have the academic freedom to include any critical perspectives, mine or Jameson's book or any perspectives that are that would be perceived as critical of Teach for America. They're not allowed to include that in their curriculum because Teach for America, as I said, has put pressure on the university and on them as professors to 
to only include perspectives that would look look good for TFA. In uh, episode four of Truth for America, we spoke with two Bay Area alums, and we talk with uh, them about their challenges with the university partner here in California. So I'd invite you to listen to that conversation. And so there's a couple pieces of interesting news that occurred this week on the internet. One, the alums in episode four were anonymous. And someone put a comment on my blog trying to out those alums uh, and make their names public. So I thought that that was a really sort of threatening gesture that they, that they, that whoever uh, did that with an anonymous name and without an email. So I thought that was a really interesting development. I, there was two other developments this week. One, uh, Jameson Brewer was featured on NPR's Marketplace. Marketplace did a short piece on Teach for America. And what's interesting about Marketplace Marketplace is they often uh, have Windy Cop on t- and you know talking about Windy Cop's internationalization of Teach for America. Uh, Teach for America has been exported to other countries. It's called Teach for All, and Windy had been living in Europe, uh, pressing for Teach for America to be exported to many uh, international countries. And but but this time Marketplace uh, took a little more critical view. They were talking about the layoffs that uh, Teach for America is uh, implementing in D.C. and. And when I contacted a friend at Teach for America about this, I forwarded it to him. He said, oh, that's old news. And I said, no, no, no. It's not last year's layoffs. It's this year's layoffs. Because Teach for America has missed their recruiting goals for a couple of years. Now, one interesting tidbit that also Mercedes Schneider uh, discussed on her education blog this week was that 70% of prospective TFA core members decided not to apply because of the counter narratives that are out there now in the public space. And in the Bellwether report, last year, they talked about how Teacher America has underestimated how social media and new media has allowed Teacher America uh, alums to talk about their experiences in ways uh, and in narratives that haven't aren't controlled by the national organization. So I thought that was really interesting. And then just yesterday, I received an email from a, an alumnus of, of Teacher America saying that she was trying to post uh, an article by Valerie Strauss, the Washington Post, about the layoffs. And Facebook had identified this article as being abusive, which means that too many people on the internet had marked this Washington Post article as spam, and that meant that all of Facebook, you could not post this article. It wouldn't allow you to post the article. So after a flurry of probably 100 tweets where Facebook was notified off of my account when I made this uh, public, Facebook sent me a message on Twitter saying that they had made a mistake and that there was a bug and that they were going to actually now unblock this Teach for America article uh, from the Washington Post. And so uh, what's really interesting is that not only quelling of information occurred via marketing and media, there was even an attempt on Facebook to limit the Washington Post's article by identifying it as abusive spam, a Washington Post piece about the layoff. So I, I think I think this is these are really important uh developments this week, especially that 70% number that says that the counter narratives that are being published by alumni, of course, I've authored two briefs with the National Education Policy Center where I've looked at all of the peer-reviewed research over the last four or five years. It it seems that the public is engaging with these conversations uh, like they haven't before. Do you agree with that assessment? I very much agree with that. And I I think that, you know, having started some of this work, you know, know, four or five years ago, I recall people telling me, you know, you're, you're sort of wasting your time being critical of, of Teach for America. They're too large. You know, you, you can't take them on. Uh, you know, they're just going to keep growing. You know, don't waste your time. And, you know, I've really seen in the last two years, Teach for America has really had to shift its tactics to more of the defensive. I think that the way that they do it is problematic. But it, it, it's very rewarding to see the fact that a counter narrative is being considered and even not just so much thinking about counter narratives, you know, within a silo, but at the very, very, very least, being able to think about and discuss Teach for America with both viewpoints. 
I think that that is something that has been missing for such a long time. It's what enabled Teach for America to grow as rapidly as they did both in this country and as you pointed out, Julian, across the, the globe, right? This idea that they're just innately good. And so the fact that these counter narratives are coming together in books and blogs and news stories, it's really exciting to see just from the sense of hoping for a more balanced conversation uh, surrounding this organization. What do you think, Sarah? Do you think that the, that the paradigm is shifting? Yeah, and I think that it's also happening both from some of the Teach for America counter-narrative work, but I also think that it's situated in this broader context of a growing national awareness around institutional racism and structural injustice. I think that movements like Black Lives Matter have contributed to people like the average American understanding that having a really well-intentioned individual trying their best won't desegregate our neighborhoods or won't change the differential school funding. Like I think there is a broader movement that is happening that is contributing to some of this critique of Teach for America. I don't know, Amber, I, I asked you this question in episode three, right? Um, and you've had a couple of weeks to think about it, but due to some of the recent events, what do you think? Are you still in the same spot? No, I, I, there's a lot of traction lately. I've noticed that it is a, it is a more honest there now. I, I didn't do this three weeks ago, but I'm seeing it now. Um, we have a couple seats up for election on our, De- our Denver Public School Board. With the, the elections coming, we're seeing people speak a more complex narrative around, like Sarah said, lots of things. Um, and talking about structural injustice and racism and systemic classism. And, and that that's tied for America. So at, at the very least, there is this more honest narrative about about um, charter schools, about testing, you know, standardized testing, and about Teach for America, and about meritocracy. And you're seeing people see have more balanced conversations, whereas I think we only saw that dominant Eric. So I am seeing a difference, and particularly even in just the last month. So last year I was, I was sitting in my office, and I got a call from a producer from Al Jazeera America. May they rest in peace. What a great and fascinating uh, network they were. And said, you know, can you do a remote to talk about Teach for America? And so I said, oh, cor- of course. And so, I, you know, I did this 30-second live slot with Joey Chen on uh, uh, America Tonight. And one of the things that I said at the time was, why is it that reformers seem to be the least interested in reform? Uh, Talking about Teach for America, because Teach for America's model hadn't really changed all that much in in a couple of decades. Now, what's interesting about some of these recent developments uh, is that Teach for America is making some changes. Uh, One of the critiques uh, in the past was that the core was primarily white. The principal in episode one from Houston talked about that. But now the core is you know, more diverse. Some people say it's uh, more, a little more than 50% folks of color. You see with the layoffs, Teacher America is saying that they're going to focus more on local. I know professors that are uh, consulting with Teacher America to design culturally relevant pedagogy. Teacher America says they've changed. They are saying that they're reforming. Do you think that's true? Do you think that they are really becoming a different organization than they have? have been for the last several decades? Yeah, slightly. I mean, I think there, those aren't lies that they have increased their diversity. They are looking at culturally responsive pedagogy. However, the deep structural change, I still, no matter what color of the court, no matter what percent of the core um, looks of color, the, the negative, the rhetoric that's coming out is a bit white supremacist and challenge um, what is being taught, uh, how school funded. They're still, they're still placing so many of their our candidates end up in, uh, they don't call them no excuses charters anymore, but they're, they're running these highly um, compliance driven um, charter schools. You know, the, the change that Teach for America, that they've announced and they've been announcing just for, you know, the past couple of years. Um, it, the jaded part of me tends to think that it's a little, it's too little to speak, or that the changes are surface level only. Uh, the more optimistic side of me really hopes that they're meaningful changes. But again, I think that in a lot of ways they might be too late. You know, the idea of centralizing the organization and giving more control to local areas, I think that that makes a lot of sense. I think that uh, that's, you know, likely sound judgment. The problem is, is that even though if Teach for America shifts or as they shift to, to more localized regions, I think that there's a legacy within the organization that really reifies and reinforces white cultural assumptions about meritocracy and what 
success looks like, right? So this idea that, you know, communities of color don't have good role models that they need to get out of and flee their communities. The best way to do that is to get uh, good test scores and then go to an Ivy League school like the person standing at the front of the room, regardless of the color of the person standing at the front of the room. And so, yes, it's true that Teach America has diversified its core over the past couple of years. The past couple of years. Again, that for me, in whatever way that we should celebrate that with Teach for America, it's problematic in the sense that Teach for America has been criticized for 25 years that it has been a largely white organization. It's only recently that the organization has started making this shift. And so again, I, I hope that it's a, a legitimate, meaningful shift. And it's not just a, an attempt to stave off the criticism that also coincidentally started about the same time that Teach for America started making these efforts. But again, regardless of the front of the room, if the pedagogy is reinforcing the hyper standardization uh, environment, but also behaviorist, right? Where we have to control and the body and the, the mouth and everything of, of a student. I think that those are dehumanizing approaches to education and even within different regional contexts. I think if that's still the approach, uh, then the solutions or changes that they're implementing are really just surface level and, and won't actually make any meaningful impacts when it comes to classroom instruction. Sir, what do you think? Has, has Teach for America really changed or is it? Just, are these just surface changes? Has the model essentially just remained the same? Teachers who go into communities for short-term stays uh, with, with very little uh, training and training that is... Uh, as Jameson stated, problematic? Or do you think that they're really headed in a new direction for the next five years? I believe that they're making changes in response to some of the growing critiques. I think my own experience of interacting with Teach for America have shifted and changed how I would respond to your question. I think I entered into this work really believing that there could be positive change within TFA, that there would be redemption within the institution, that we would think that it was for lack of knowledge that they weren't acting differently. But I think it's puzzling that still as recently, even with all of these changes and with a greater amount of power that's being accorded to local branches, that these local branches are also still engaging in what is essentially censorship and like narrative control, both of its core members and even up to the levels of its professors. I think that Teach for America needs to not only take some of these particular changes that we're discussing, but it also needs to be accountable to the critiques that are being made by stakeholders, to the critiques that are being made by students, by committee members, by its own core members, and by its professors. And until there is like a space and a mechanism for that to happen, I don't know that Teach for America can, can grow in the ways that it claims it wants to. Real change, real equity would be when the disempowered have more power and when those without voice have voice. And I think their TFA is making changes, but they're still very much in control and in power and they're, they're promoting the changes that they're making. I think the changes are probably um, not as real and deep as they need to be. So I really want to invite listeners of of this podcast, Truth for America, whether you're listening on iTunes or YouTube or uh, SoundCloud or any of the other places where this podcast resides, please check out uh, these two books, these two counter narratives. I think it's very clear that these conversations that alums and researchers and academics and parents and teachers and principals and many other stakeholders are having about Teach for America, I think that we're having a more honest discussion as Amber said. So I just wanted to give each of you just 30 seconds to conclude uh, your thoughts for this fifth episode of Truth for America, the counter narratives. 30 seconds. No, I'll go first. 30 yeah. seconds. I, I would just like to say thank you uh, uh, for the space to discuss this, but more importantly, thank you to the authors um, of each of the, the chapters within I mean, Kathleen's book. I think that you know, we had conversations with a lot of them, and in fact, we, we actually had other chapters, but people felt that they wanted to use pseudonyms because they were afraid of reprisals from Teach for America. And so it's a very brave thing uh, to speak out against an organization uh, that not only is perceived um, to try to marginalize uh, dissenters, but has a track record, right, and an exposed track record of doing that. So I just want to say thank you uh, to the contributors of the volume, you know, who took a very brave step to share counter narratives by themselves, but also in the collection. I think that it, it tells a very powerful story that, that folks have to hear. And this is Amber. I just want to say that the Truth for America series has also helped get the word out and has, is a counter narrative in and of itself. And that 
these conversations, these chances to hear the podcast and to read the counter narratives in these two books, it gives courage to speak one's own narrative when it runs counter. So having more counter narratives out there, finding ways to um, share them and hear them helps then bring out more counter narratives. So I just, I'm, I'm glad to be part of this and I'm glad to, to see the work um, of you three here today and just know that it really does make a difference in helping people share their counter narratives. Okay, Sarah, now it's going to be up to you to bring us home. So part of why I'm really excited about being part of Truth for America is I think the goals that you, Julian, and Amber, and Jameson have are also aligned with what I'm currently working on, um, especially um, in this project that I have with Beth Patel, who's a former organizer with Philadelphia Student Union. We're currently working on, a, on creating a discussion guide to go along with my book that critical core members and prospective TFA recruits can use, and people also just generally interested in understanding um, some of the complexities of educational inequity can use to kind of grow a critical consciousness for action, a collective critical consciousness for action. That my takeaway and hope in both writing the book and working on the book discussion guide is that it's for people to start asking what are the truths of their own experiences individually and as a group and where do we go from here. The core members I interviewed in my book help to pave a way for examining the truth of people's lived experiences. They call to attention how the work impacts them, whether it is the newly emergent alcoholism or their need for prescription medication. They start to see a counselor for the first time, the strain that it puts on their relationship. They delve into all of these things and invite us also to name the complexity of a fuller truth. 